This is the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. And now from the Hour of History studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, your Hour of History starts right now. Hey everyone, welcome to Hour of History. It's your host, Stephen Bauman. This week, I was thinking about Gandhi because on October 2nd, it was his 150th anniversary of his birth. And Gandhi is such an important figure in history. He's not only useful as a teaching tool, but also as a center, a controversial figure for debate. Gandhi spent the Indian Independence Day, August 15th, 1947, in Calcutta. And it got me to thinking about Calcutta. Not only was Gandhi this figure that attempted to bring together different populations within India, but he also represented a lot of the British Empire in getting his education in England, traveling to South Africa where he worked in the British Empire in South Africa, and eventually coming back to India where he would lead Indian nationalist movement, although never taking a distinctly political role. And I thought about how I've attempted to take cities and think about five or ten characteristics of the city that defines hundreds of years, which is an enormously difficult task. But looking back at Calcutta, thinking about Gandhi being there during Independence Day and the main road running through Calcutta now, Mahatma Gandhi Road that connects the two major railway stations, I thought it would be useful to revisit Calcutta. And think while we're doing it about an exercise that I share with my students at the beginning of the year, one that might be valuable for all of us to think about. I ask my students at the beginning of the year to write a one-sentence history of their lives. For a lot of them, this is an extremely difficult task. Even though they're only 20 to 25 years old, in large part, it's very hard to put an entire life into one sentence. This is the same sort of struggle that historians face every day. How can I truly describe Calcutta in only five to ten items? It has a history since the 1600s. It involves empires, conquering other empires, the birth of economic systems, all sorts of interesting different aspects of life that make it almost infinitely difficult to categorize. One thing we learn from the exercise of writing one-sentence histories is that there's an enormous amount that you have to leave out. These are the silences of history. So keep that in mind when you're listening to my most important items of Calcutta. While a fun exercise, there's a lot that is said in what is not said as well. So enjoy the facts, enjoy the presentation, and also think critically about how rich a city is even beyond its most important features. This episode of Hour of History is brought to you by Printful. Printful is an easy, on-demand, online printing, fulfillment, and shipping operation. Just go to hourofhistory.com forward slash Printful, P-R-I-N-T-F-U-L, to see all the various custom products you can choose from for you or your business. There's mugs, sweatshirts, hats, swimwear, all that, and much, much more. Go to hourofhistory.com forward slash printful now and mock up merch with your own custom brand to sell from your store. Now, uh, this city has a long, important history both in Asia and in the West, and it's a city that has multiple names, it has multiple histories, it has comments made by famous poets, it has famous poets and writers from the East, famous poets and writers from the West that have been there, and there's always descriptions you see of this city that are uh, putting it in a place, and I'm going to try to find if those are correct. People who have gone to this city and who have described what it is uh, have usually come out with a representation, often a character that is something that is open to a lot of debate. And hopefully I can answer some of that debate by looking into its rich history. So let's get started. Now, the city is called Kolkata. It has been called Kolkata since 2001 when the government of West Bengal, the government of the city, uh, decided to rename it based on the Bangla pronunciation of the word. The previous 
a few centuries, the city was called Calcutta, and it continues to be called Calcutta in the Western world, despite the very minuscule amount of difference in the actual pronunciation. For ease of listening and ease of pronunciation, myself not being a Bangla speaker, and I'm going to do my best throughout this, city, this city's podcast, I'm going to say Calcutta throughout the show. Now, with that out of the way, Calcutta is one of the most important uh, cities in India, even still today. It's the capital of the Indian state of West Bengal. Uh, Bangladesh is its own independent country and hopefully in this series we'll get into a little bit why Bangladesh and West Bengal are part of different countries. But before we get that far, we need to mention that Calcutta is still enormously significant on the world scale. It has over 14 million people in the region of Calcutta. In the city proper, it has over 4 million people. And it has an enormous cultural significance in terms of writers and historical actors, especially during the period of British rule. Yet, when I decided to start this series on this new city, I couldn't start with the British. Just like when I was talking about Havana, it, it felt wrong to just start with the Spanish. Uh, I wanted to look beyond what was before the British, yet it was extremely difficult with Calcutta because Calcutta was just one of three small and rather insignificant fishing villages of the Mughal dynasty. So even though this city or historians have traced the history of this city for nearly two millennia, people have lived here for 2,000 years, yet uh, the real written recorded history of the city of Calcutta begins in the late 17th century in the 1690s when it's actually bought or leased really by the East India Company. Still, I don't want to ignore those thousands of years of history simply because they don't have a written record. In fact, it's important, especially like uh, when talking about any city, especially without the written record, that we at least come to terms with the people who lived there, people, generations and generations who lived there uh, without sort of leaving a written Western record. It's still important history. So my first two items are significant not only for this period that comes before the British, but they continue to be significant throughout the entire history of this city of Calcutta. So the first thing I want to choose is fish. The Elish is an important fish. It's the official fish of Bangladesh. It is uh, important in Bengali cuisine. Um, and it is a fish that is found in the Hooghly River, which is where Calcutta is located. So Calcutta, this massive city now, was once a tiny village in the Mughal dynasty that was located on a river. It was likely that generations and generations of people would fish in this river, fish being one of the predominant sources of nutrition and food for this culture, and it has continued this way for millennia. So fish is the first item, and this continues to be important not only through this era of simplicity in this era of not having millions of people as being an important food source, but it also remains important as we go later into the colonial period and towards things like the Bengal famine in the 20th century and the famines that happen even earlier um, when these land, this land that uh, was plentiful for thousands of years ends up, uh, ends up not being able to provide for one reason or another to the millions of people that live there. And a lot of people lose their life because of it. So the fish is both a source of abundance and a source of history for the people of Calcutta. And the second thing that I'm choosing for this week is the goddess Kali. So uh, religion is always going to be an important theme in the city of Calcutta's history. When people mention Calcutta, immediately a lot of people start to think of Mother Teresa, who's going to come into this later, uh, especially Westerners. But uh, Kali, the goddess uh of the Hindu religion is important to this city and it's one of the potential explanations for why it's called Kolkata because there is a famous 
Kali Ghat, a famous temple dedicated to Kali that has been significant and was significant through much of the Mughal dynasty, where Hindus would come and pay homage to this goddess before making a journey. So that still exists there. It's a landing stage on the banks of the Huli River, the Huli River being a uh, uh, link to the Ganges River and one of the most important rivers in all of India. This location next to the river is also important and significant in the history of Calcutta, not only because of its ability to sort of provide a place for worship with this goddess, but also provide food and the fish. It also provides transportation and that becomes central when this fishing village uh, that has enjoyed thousands and thousands of years of rather uninterrupted uh, life and yes, systematic generation after generation is met by some traders. So uh, Portuguese traders are in India as early as the 1500s and in Bengal as well. So the Portuguese had been in Bengal, they had established trading posts in Bengal as early as the 16th century. But it's not until the 1690s that the British actually buy uh, three fishing villages from the Mughal Empire. So that's sort of where we're going to leave this traditionalist fishing village society and move on into the more modern history of Calcutta. So, the re so just the preview, the goddess Kali and the fish, that's sort of like the baseline understanding these fishing villages of this original Kolkata. We don't necessarily know uh, exactly what it means. There were a couple other villages, but what happens is Calcutta becomes the most significant city in the British Raj. In 1690, uh, the East India Company, led by the English, arrives in Bengal and is trying to sort of call, uh, consolidate its business model. It sends people out, administrators, to go and find potential places in which they can set up bases and start this sort of uh, uh, production, start these tradings with India. So Calcutta was a fishing village and it was bought for only a couple hundred rupees that would be repaid every year to the Mughal Empire and it was sort of a tax uh, tax right to use the land that was transferred to the East India Company. So Job Charnock becomes the official founder of Calcutta. Now this is disputed later on in its history when the government says that Calcutta has no actual founder because there were actually thousands of years of history before the colonial era. So it's important to think about when we look at any cities, especially a city like Calcutta that's located on a river, that's located in an area where humanity, humanity could succeed and humanity could flourish before we entered these sort of Western models of trade and commerce and politics and things like that. So we consider that as sort of the beginning and when I have to break a city up into five simple stages or ten simple items, I think it's fair and necessary to give the first two items at least to those 2,000 years. Now I'm not an archeologist or an anthropologist so I can't go back and sort of make the whole show about those 2,000 years, but it is something we should think about and we should give time to the thought and the generations and generations of people who had lived in these villages long before the British ever came. Now once the East India Company is there and the city of Calcutta becomes to more and more fortified, it becomes more and more central location in trade, its history is irrevocably changed and the fate of the people who lived in this fishing village is also changed as more and more people from all over Bengal and all over the world come to make Calcutta one of the greatest cities in the world. Yet such changes aren't without their conflict as the British find themselves boiling over the angers of the citizens of Calcutta and the armies of the Nawab of Bengal. 
The dungeon was a strongly barred room, and was not intended for the confinement of more than two or three men at a time. There were only two windows and a projecting veranda outside. The thick iron bars within impeded the ventilation, while fires raging in different parts of the fort suggested an atmosphere of further oppressiveness. The prisoners were packed so tightly that the door was difficult to close. By nine o'clock, several had died, and many more were delirious. A frantic cry for water now became general, and one of the guards, more compassionate than his fellows, caused some water to be brought to the bars. Where Mr. Howell and two or three others received it in their hats and passed it on to men behind them. In their impatience to secure, it was nearly all split, and the little they drank seemed to only increase their thirst. Self-control was soon lost. Those in remote parts of the room struggled to reach the window, and fearful tumult ensued, in which the weakest were trampled or pressed to death. They raved, fought, prayed, blasphemed, and many fell exhausted to the floor, where suffocation put them an end to their torments. At about eleven o'clock, the prisoners began to drop off fast. At length, at six in the morning, Shiraj Ujwala awoke and ordered the door be opened. Of the 146, only 23 remained alive, and they were either stupefied or raving. Fresh air soon revived them, and the commander was taken before the Nawab, who expressed no regret for what had occurred, and gave no other sign of sympathy than ordering the Englishmen a chair and a glass of water. Notwithstanding this indifference, some others acquit him of any intention of causing a catastrophe, and ascribe to it the malice of certain inferior officers, but many find he was guilty. This is an account of the Black Hole of Calcutta. The Black Hole of Calcutta is this prison scene in which the ruling party of Calcutta takes some East Indian soldiers, puts them in a prisoner, and, and allows them to die in this tense, tense situation. The Black Hole of Calcutta, although it happened in 1756, just almost a half a century after Charles Eyre bought this small fishing village, it takes place as a crucial point in the colonial enterprise that British unleash on India and especially Calcutta. In fact, the Black Hole of Calcutta becomes one of the most important colonial rallying points, not only for the British, the East India Company and the British Empire, but also for the Indian nationalist movement a couple centuries later. 1756, whatever happened in that prison, we don't really know. There's different accounts. These prisoners were probably not treated to the typical European standard, but then again, it was an invading army of a merchant organization attempting to colonize a new city. So this Black Hole of Calcutta has an important role in the myth-making. It blew the British confidence and the sort of status that they perceived that they had in Bengal, and it challenged their supremacy, and they vowed revenge. A year later, in 1757, Robert Clive makes a deal with Mir Jafar, who is a commander of this Siraj Uddwala's army, the Nawab's army, the same guy who was supposedly outside of this prison torturing these British soldiers. He has someone that's commanding his armies, Mir Jafar, just under him, who's willing to make a deal with the East India Company, with Robert Clive, and is willing to betray Siraj Uddwala and the ruling class in Calcutta and help the British win dominance. So from this black hole in Calcutta, from this black hole of empire, grows the Battle of Plassey, a giant British victory in 1757 in which the East India Company wins and Tagore has, the poet from Bengal, has immortalized by saying, at night's ends, the traitor's scales became a scepter. So at the end of this black hole episode, at the end of this battle of Plassey, Calcutta has undergone complete transformation from the fishing village that I left you off with last week into an important imperial outpost for the East India Company. The growth of Fort William, ironically, where, where this black hole is, 
becomes memorialized, continues to grow, and becomes the center of the British Empire in India. So while the East India Company still has this sort of carte blanche to rule over Bengal, uh, it, it represents the British in this city and it begins the imperial project in Bengal. So we're transferred now from a fishing village to one of the most important imperial outposts in the world. So that first item, the Black Hole of Calcutta, it's memorialized immediately, a monument is built to it, and it remains an important part of the memory that we're going to revisit later in this series on Calcutta. It's important to the city's history as, as well as the empire's and as well as India's. One of the first things the British do once they've established clear control over Calcutta, once they've defeated Siraj and the Nawab of Bengal, uh, once they've maintained military and economic dominance for years, is they begin a project of uh, colonization of education and information. So what the British begin to do is study what they're around. This is very much in the Enlightenment vein of thinking, how do we understand this strange world, this different world. It's clearly not Britain and we need to make sense out of it if we're going to be the rulers. We need to bring them the enlightenment. So the British begin creating societies of learning such as the Asiatic Society. Uh, these are built in the new white town of Calcutta, built in a neoclassical style, attempting to sh sort of show the, the greatness of colonialism versus the backwardness of the fishing village that once was Calcutta. And this from this becomes the sort of like roots of the Orientalist philosophy that is common in much of imperial works and, and sort of the, the othering and changing of these uh, Indian cultures into something that is distinctly foreign, different, and something that needs to be categorized and put into a box much like those philosophies of the West. So in addition to the Asiatic society, texts like the Bhagavad Gita are selected. They're translated from Sanskrit into Bengali, into English, and they're taught in these societies and they're taught in these schools. So ancient texts are sort of selected and the British are saying in a way, we need to find you your Bible. So it's clear you Hindus, you Muslims aren't like us. What are, what are your texts? What is your main text that is going to tell us mostly about you? How can we really understand you? And what happens is an enormous growth in the education of the Bengali middle class, the sort of the Bengali people who side with the British be begin to rediscover uh, in a new light, not necessarily rediscover, but um, reinterpret these texts that have been important to India's history. So one example of this is Ram Mohan Roy, who helps usher in what is now called the Bengali Renaissance. So the second item, if I'm allowed to make it an item for the city of Calcutta, is the Bengali Renaissance. So Renaissance means rebirth, and just like in Europe, there's sort of a rebirth of this uh, philosophy going back to Greek and Roman times. In Bengal, under the East India Company, there's a Bengali Renaissance in which scholars of these Asiatic texts, scholars that are following this sort of enlightenment project of reclaiming history, begin to look back to texts like the Bhagavad Gita and at the same time mix them with enlightenment ideals that are coming from Europe from places like Scotland with John Locke and things like that. So Ram Mohan Roy is one of the figureheads of this Bengali Renaissance movement among many, many other important thinkers that I cannot possibly mention in one short episode, but I can certainly write about later in the Hour of History blog. And one example of how this Bengali Renaissance happens is through Ram Mohan Roy's creation of Brahmo Samaj. And Brahmo Samaj is sort of this quasi 
uh, Christian-like Hindu church in which Ram Mohan Roy is borrowing from the Protestant traditions that are being brought from Great Britain and at the same time taking from the Hindu texts and the Hindu classics. So you see these uh, Brahmo Samaj temples in Calcutta rising up with Doric columns looking like some mix of the ancient Greek Renaissance of Europe and these classic Hindu uh, faith markers and Hindu beliefs and the revitalization of the language of Sanskrit and these sort of predecessors to the more commonly spoken Bengali languages that were in Calcutta. Like I mentioned, this divide between uh, those who are have access to education and those who do not creates a stark divide between the city. And Calcutta is separated into what is called White Town and Black Town. And so the heart of White Town, this Park Street, has these neoclassical learning societies, these clubs, these churches, these forts, these memorials to events like the Black Hole of Calcutta, and the Black Town is North Bengal, has winding alleys, it has, uh, it's a basically a different city, but this is where these reformers like Ram Mohan Roy and Bakim Chandra Chattopate and Swami Vivekananda are all beginning to build, uh, build new philosophies and create a new city. So the 18th century in Calcutta is an enormously transformative period. It ushers it into a new global era, a new era in which enlightenment meets India, a new era in which capitalism, things like that, are thrown into the mix and Calcutta begins to grow at an extreme rate. Under East India Company control. It is no longer a fishing village, and we see an enormous part from what was once this small Kolikata that was purchased for a mere 1,300 rupees in 1698 to this new English colony that has churches like St. Anne's built in 1709 and memorials to events like the Black Hole of Calcutta in 1756. The Bhagavad Gita ironically is translated first in 1776 and as we know something else big happens in 1776 on the other side of the world and with the American Revolution the British turn their focus on India and Calcutta is launched into its most important role in history. So we have the setup for a next century of growth for Calcutta, the rise of Indian nationalism, and the emergence of Calcutta in global historical significance, all from this black hole. So what was it? What did it look like? What was this British Calcutta? How did people see and go about their days? The town was uniformly built in the form of a hollow square, with an area of 50 to 100 feet each way with the occasion of Hindu festivals. It's covered, and when it's lighted up, it looks very handsome. The house itself is seldom more than two stories, the lower portion on three sides of it used only for storerooms or for domestics. On the remaining side, and that always the northern one, is to be found Thakur Gar, or abode of the Hindu gods. This is always finished with care, and when the owner is wealthy, the lusters contained in this sacred apartment are of considerable value. Above the stairs are the public apartments, with verandas, always inwards. These are generally long, narrow slips containing a profusion of lusters and wall lights, altogether affording but a mean view to a European. Jutting out from this main building are situated the accommodations allotted to the females and the families. They consist of smaller hollow squares with petty verandas opening inwards, and some houses have two or three sets of these zananas with one or more tanks attached, but which are generally kept in a neglected state. This is the account of a European traveler who's walking through the black town of Calcutta. Now, I know, I know, my last two items, the black hole of empire and the Bengali renaissance weren't really items per se, but they were good representations of the growth that was happening in Calcutta under the British Empire, the British regime that took over and took control shortly after this Battle of Plassey. 
in the late middle 18th century. So now I introduce you with that reading to what was called the Black Town of Calcutta. And it has been used by a lot of authors, most of them British, most of them imperial, to describe the separation that was taking place in this new Calcutta that was becoming quickly one of the most important imperial cities in the British Empire. There was a division, they said, between Black Town and White Town. And for a long time, people have used this division to make Calcutta into a separated, segregated city between the empire and between the natives. And this was sort of the idea that was sold back to Britain, that there was a sort of separation between the two, and that it was possible to discern what they were. In this episode, with my next two items taking me up to item six, I use the black town and the white town as representative not only of how Calcutta has been understood in the past by historians, but also by how it's sort of misrepresentative of what actually was happening in Calcutta and misrepresentative of cities in general. A lot of times people like to understand cities with a clear dividing line, and it's certainly true in some cases. In some cities, you can cross a street and be in an entirely different area. That absolutely happens throughout the world, and we study some cities. That's an important feature of that city. People wanted to do that with Calcutta, with the black and white towns, and you read some of these travel logs that sort of explain what happened, like the one I just did, and they describe an area that's different, in a city houses that are built for Bengalis, or as the English called them, uh, babu, which was mostly pejorative, a way of saying like sort of different than European, uh, a, you know, a Bengali describing someone that was of lower class. And the British would almost always say that the babus lived in these black, in the black town, whereas the British lived in the white town. But the thing is, the Black Town, this area that was sort of away from uh, Fort William, away from the English center of Calcutta, was that it was much more diverse. There were middle class baboos. There were middle class uh, Bengalis who had made a significant amount of money and had built respectable houses in this town. Like the one described is a multiple story house that has room, separate quarters for the women and separate areas in which the house is divided and a, a lot of possessions that can be stored underneath and a lot of space in a lot of areas. There were rather wealthy clerks and people who worked within the British imperial system. Because one of the things about the British imperial system, especially in Calcutta, was that the British set it up so most of the work was done by Bengalis. So most of the administrative work was staffed by Bengalis. They far outnumbered the British. And so there were people in Bengal who made quite a good career out of it. In addition to this, and one of the focuses of the black town typically, is that there are a lot of migrants coming to Calcutta. So what was once a fishing village in the 18th century, in the 19th century has over 200,000 people as early as 1820. So people from all over Bengal, uh, which is quickly uh, becoming controlled large part by the East India Company are coming to Calcutta for a chance of making a life. So amongst these big middle class Bengali mansions are also small little villages, tiny alleys, crowded bazaars, and huts that are not quite as nice as some of these uh, areas that are described in this tourist accounts. But one thing to mention is that these people are being successful in finding jobs, and they have to be employed in British places. So although the black town is on the other side of Calcutta, separated by a main road from the white town, and there's numerous paras, tolas, and tulis, which are the actual sort of like neighborhoods and areas and constructions within the city, the Europeans sort of categorize it in this way, but a lot of the people who come to live in Calcutta end up going between these areas because a lot of the jobs are in the white town working in a lot of the British companies, whether it's working as a clerk or it's working as a servant in one of the British manors. Here's a description of the white town so we get a little contrast before I explain that the contrast gets muddled by the amount of traversing between the two. Written in 1780s, 
trees, the streets are broad, the line of buildings surrounding two sides of the esplanade of the fort, that's Fort William, is magnificent, and it adds greatly to the superb appearance that the houses are detached from each other and insulated in great space. The buildings are on a large scale from the necessity of having free circulation of air. The general approach to these houses is by flight of steps, with great projecting porticos, surrounded by colonnades or arcades which give them the appearance of Grecian temples. The English quarter occupies the south end of the city. Here a beautiful plain, a mile and a half long, goes down the water's edge, having Fort William in the center on the river bank. On its inner sides, the plain is bordered with the stately houses of the English, with their white walls, broad open verandas, and green Venetian shutters. On the east side are the numerous English homes of the Chauringi, always increasing both in numbers and in their rents. So this explains sort of the idyllic vision that's being sent home of the white town. So the contrast that the British wanted to describe and do this and classify, and this is part of the imperial project, is one of the goals of empire was always to classify everything, to understand everything, to put everything in its place. This goes here and this goes here. And part of that was uh, present in the white town. There were th it was sparsely populated when compared to the black town. There were things like the governor's house, which were meant to replicate an English country manor. It was closer to the fort, always near that reminder of the black hole of empire. It had, it features the Maidan, which is the, has been called the lungs of Calcutta. It's a giant green space that is its space compared to more densely populated area in the black town. At the same time, the white town and the black town of Calcutta are never homogenous. They always have groups going back and forth from each end. There's overlapping geographies that are crossing streets. People are free to move between the spaces. There are certainly access restrictions to places like the governor's mansion, but there are quite a few Indians who are working in the governor's mansion as servants, not to mention the amount of British generals who also have mistresses and wives even of Indian descent. So there's mixed families and that begins to become less and less as more British women start coming to Calcutta as it becomes more and more important in the British Empire. But at the beginning of this, there's an enormous amount of crisscross between these places. The black town and the white town, although in an imperial textbook or a travelogue might seem like the most separate places on earth, are enormously connected spaces. Hybrid cultures are created inside of Calcutta and they flow directly through the black town in the white town. So while one resident of the 19th century Calcutta might understand between theater and Wood Street, there's an enormous amount of European wealth, they would know that you go just one street down and you're going to be able to find a crowded bazaar, even though it's not necessarily supposed to be in that area. Additionally, as groups begin to gain more money, as the Bengali Renaissance takes off, people like the Tagores, the family of the famous poet Rabindranath Tagore, begin to buy houses in the White Town. So White Town is not even exclusively English. There's diversity of residents. So Calcutta continues to grow. It has this sort of imperial imagination where there is a separation. The British see their buildings as different, but in reality, it's created in a hybrid culture that's much more like the sort of diversity that India typically sees. There's houses of worship for almost every religion. There's Buddhism. There's a new cathedral built, St. Paul's, just like that of London. And there's Hindu temples, there's Muslim mosques, there's Zoroastrian temples, there's all sorts of religious, different, diverse, and hybrid cultures that are present throughout India. So despite the, the rhetoric of the imperial project, Calcutta sort of begins to live by its own rules. And as Calcutta grows over 200,000, which is rather significant for the early 1800s, 
uh, the British lose the American war. They turn their focus to India and Calcutta becomes the capital of the British enterprise in India. And it remains the most important city for much of the 19th century. So two cities in the British Empire begin to develop extraordinarily fast in the 19th century, London and Calcutta. And Calcutta becomes enormously important in the British Empire. So in finishing this week and my two not really items as much as they are ideas, the black town and the white town, you can already see the tension beginning to grow between this idea of neat scientific classification that is brought on by the British and the Imperial Project and between the hybrid heterogeneous realities of life in a diverse and vibrant country like India. Thanks for listening. This has been a presentation of Hour of History, where it's our world, anytime, any place. As usual, if you want some more further reading on this topic, Calcutta, or any of the great topics that I've covered with in various interviews and talks in the past, head on over to www.hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's hourofhistory.com forward slash rex, R E C. S. There, I suggest books from subjects ranging from Calcutta, what I talked about today, the sort of books that I use to find this background information, secondary sources as they're called in the business, and uh, two books about, say, North Korea or Cuba, topics that have come up frequently on Hour of History. Thanks again for listening. Next week, we'll be back with part two of Calcutta, talking about the city on its march to independence and modernity. Have a good one. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at ourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast. And if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at ourofhistory.com forward slash blog with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care, and again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast.